Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to this fully circular talk on joint solutions collaboration as the key to drive the circular economy for plastics. I'm Melinda Crane, and on behalf of our host, Covestro, and its CEO, Markus Steilemann. Hello, Markus. Hi, Melinda. Great to be here with you. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. I am very honored to serve as your moderator today, ladies and gentlemen. This is the latest in a series of talks brought to you by the global high-tech polymer supplier Covestro and inspired by the conviction that the future of the industry as well as the future of the planet depend on committing to the circular economy as a guiding principle. To build that circle, we need joined up action. We need cooperation among stakeholders across industries, across sectors, across regions to foster innovation, to bring new technologies to scale, and to strengthen coordination in matching supply and demand when it comes to materials. These are complex challenges, no doubt about it but the potential gains are enormous. The circular economy could generate economic benefits of up to 4 trillion euros by 2030. We all strive for a better world, a world that preserves the natural foundations of life. This doesn't have to be a utopia. However, the reality is still different. As the world's population continues to grow, we are facing an ever-increasing demand for energy, raw materials, and goods. Since 1970, global resource consumption has more than tripled. At the same time, climate change is becoming a real threat. In 2021, global CO2 emissions are set for their second biggest increase in history. And with 2 billion people having no access to regular waste disposal, environmental pollution is another major task. It's time to make a fundamental change. And we can make it happen because there is a great opportunity, the circular economy. This can be the key to climate neutrality, resource conservation and environmental protection. Let's make the cycle our new global guiding principle using goods longer and more often, avoiding waste, utilizing old products as a resource instead. But we will only succeed if we collaborate, politics, society, science, and the economy. The plastics industry is ready to contribute and undergo a major transition. Together, we'll pick up pace towards more circularity. So who needs to do what in which segments of the value chain to drive that fundamental change? That is our key question day today, and we have an outstanding panel of speakers to explore it. And in the interest of maximizing our discussion time, I'm going to keep the introductions very brief indeed. It is my pleasure to welcome Svenja Schulze, Germany's Federal Minister for the Environment, Nature Conservation, and Nuclear Safety. An honor that you can join us, dear Minister. And it's a pleasure to welcome Martin Neubert. He is Chief Commercial Officer and Deputy Group CEO of the renewable energy company Ørsted from Denmark. And great to have with us Dr. Susanne Kadner. She is Managing Director of the Circular Economy Initiative Deutschland at Germany's National Academy of Science and Engineering, Akatech. Great to have you with us as well. And Markus Steinemann, as CEO of Covestro, joins me live in the studio. So nice that you can be here in person with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, we want to begin our discussion with a look at the first of three key areas that could promote the circular economy. But first, just a word on how you can take part in our discussion, because we are eager to hear your questions and your brief comments. So please do send them to us via the chat function on this live stream, and I'll bring them into the discussion a little bit later on. So let's get started with a look at raw materials. When it comes to decarbonization, the plastics and polymer industry faces a dual challenge because fossil resources, and especially crude oil, serve not only as a source of energy for this industry, but also as a crucial input in the production process. Can we truly get rid of fossil resources? Let's take a closer look at the raw materials challenge. Crude oil, for a long time, the world's lubricant. 
as fuel for heating and cooling and as raw material for industry. After a drop due to the pandemic, global oil demand is expected to continue increasing again. But the use of oil releases CO2, damaging the climate. If we want to counter global warming, we need to replace it. The trick is to take the crucial element carbon from sources other than oil. There are three ways to get there. First, we can obtain renewable carbon from biomass such as corn, rapeseed or sugar beets. Another way is to increasingly use waste as a carbon source and strengthen recycling. Currently, only about 9% of all materials entering the global economy are cycled back. Thirdly, CO2 turns out to be a promising alternative to crude oil, a new role for the greenhouse gas. The plastics industry, which accounts for 6% of global oil consumption, is driving all three ways. To leave fossil fuels in the ground, to foster the circular economy, and to help make our world climate neutral. Innovation is absolutely crucial in all three areas we're going to be talking about today, but perhaps nowhere more so than in regard to raw materials. And policy and regulation are absolutely key drivers of transformation and innovation. So let me begin with you, dear Minister Schulze, if I may. And I want to quote from a new study that was commissioned by your ministry concluding that the circular economy in Germany is still in a, quote, early phase of development with little momentum. It says that to overcome weaknesses in the innovation system, more should be done to support markets for secondary raw materials and to foster entrepreneurial experimentation with new approaches to material flow management. So my question to you would be, what would be your key recommendation to Germany's next environment minister as to how to make that happen? <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's a very important study we have. So my, my two sentences for the next uh, minister is, uh, the first is we need uh, more, we uh, need to pay attention about avoiding waste and um, having more recycling. And that's by sustainable by design, having more the focus on how we design products so that they are able to be reused or uh, recycled. Um, we do that in Germany about quotas. I think that is a very good way to say, okay, you need to do the industry, need to um, bring back so the packaging uh, of and consumer products uh, to um, and, and cycle. So that, that is the first thing I think is, is very important. And the second is we need to do that through the European uh, area to the European level. We need more joint action on the European level. We have now an anchor through the, through the circular economy action plan. That is uh, very good that we have this action plan. And now we need this uh, plan to be to get in um, the reality and to have all the things we uh, we have in that plan. And that would help us in Europe to have a bigger market and have more more yeah more more, more the chance to reuse plastic and uh, to, to have a better waste management through the European level. Thank you very much. And we will, in fact, come back a little bit later on to some of the initiatives your ministry has taken in that area of recycling and quotas. But let me go now to Susanna Kadner and ask you about your own initiative's recent report. Uh, it released its circular economy roadmap for Germany earlier this year. What are the key recommendations when it comes to making alternative raw materials competitive and strengthening markets? Who needs to do what and where would you say collaboration is most essential. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much uh, yeah, for the invitation and being here to answer those interesting questions. Well, um, the initiative has developed 56 recommendations, so I'm not going to go into detail, but I think uh, two of the most important aspects are the economic incentives. So we need to make sure that secondary raw materials, for example, are price competitive with primary raw materials. 
the way this is done can be discussed certainly whether it's through a carbon levy or, or uh, raw materials taxes for a packaging sector for example this is certainly open for discussion but we need to reach this price competitiveness of these raw materials and um, especially because they need to be of a very high quality in order to replace um, primary materials of this high quality in the market. And that means a lot of investment for recyclers, for example. The second point was just mentioned quotas, very important and our ministry has taken the relevant steps for that and we really welcome this. It's important that we talk about quotas and the input of uh, recyclers in products and materials, but at the same time, the quality is also key. I've just mentioned this. So standardization efforts, especially across Europe, for example, about the quality of certain recyclers in specific material groups is also a very important element in that. And then the last point, cooperation is key in a circular economy. We need to interact with all the different stakeholders in the value chain. It's, it's new patterns, new value creation networks that are developing. And this is something we've tried to establish in the Circular Economy Initiative as well, to bring all relevant actors on one table and discuss how circular economy business models can be progressed together. Thank you very much uh, f for that. Let me come now to Martin Neubert and your own industry, the green, uh, green energy industry, of course, has been very much the product of far-sighted policy frameworks and regulatory measures. I'm thinking simply about feed-in tariffs, but many more measures besides. What would be your advice in terms of boosting the competitiveness of alternative raw materials as inputs for the plastics and polymer industry? Which levers and what types of partnerships do you think are most key? Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to this exciting panel here. Uh, so we are at Earth that uh, the global market leader on offshore wind. Uh, and when you look at the raw materials uh, that basically go into an offshore wind farm, uh, then 70-80% uh, is steel. It's steel going into the foundation structures, uh, it's steel going into the turbine towers, but we also have a large part of composite materials uh, that is used in the blades or in the nacelles. And then we have a third element, which is uh, copper and leads uh, that goes into the cable, into the transmission system. Now, the good, the good news is that 85 to 90% of an offshore wind farm can be recycled uh, after the end of life. Um, that, that is great news. But uh, at the same time, when it comes to producing, uh, for instance, primary steel, uh, you know, we want to make sure we can do this uh, by green steel. And just to give you a sense of how, how big the volume is, uh, our largest offshore wind farm, the world's largest off offshore wind farm in the world uh, is 1,218 megawatt. It powers a million of uh, households in the UK. And uh, it uh, comprises 160,000 tons of steel just in the foundation structures and another 60,000 tons that go into the turbine towers. Uh, and figuring out a way of uh, how to decarbonize the steel industry, either through uh, direct electrification, uh, because we can use that in uh, electric arc furnaces, especially uh, when it comes to uh, recycling steel, but also replacing coal uh, that it used in uh, blast furnace processes is obviously uh, super important. Uh, and here is where, you know, the renewable energy industry, uh, but also uh, processing industry, the steel industry need to work hand in hand because uh, yes, uh, there is technology available to uh, replace coal with renewable hydrogen. The challenge is uh, the costs uh, is, uh, a, there's a cost difference of a factor more than four today. What we need is uh, working together between industry, so really coupling the sectors, but we need uh, the, uh, the help and the support uh, from politics uh, in the first place now through funding schemes, uh, because we need to scale up on electrolyzers to produce renewable hydrogen that can replace fossil fuels in these uh, heating processes, uh, like in the steel industry. But as I said, also polymers are an important uh, part. Uh, the chemical industry is also very important for us uh, when it comes to the production of composites. So we're really here working hand in hand, uh, making sure we, we cover the sectors uh, and we have a regulatory regime, but also the public funding that has made uh, renewables and offshore wind uh, very great in the first place. Costs have come down significantly, but we need to do the same now in order to foster and uh, facilitate new technologies like uh, electrolysis.
Thank you very much uh, for that. And we will come back to energy, of course, a little bit later on in our discussion. Let me now ask Marcos to please link up what we've been hearing to what's happening on the ground in your industry. And I know, for example, that when it comes to raw materials, Covestro is actually using alternative materials derived from leftover food. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what is crucial to support that kind of innovation and also how you see the role of policy, including when it comes to new approaches to materials flow management, which is, by the way, one of the recommendations in uh, the Circular uh, Economy Initiatives uh, roadmap. Right, Melinda, thanks for the question. I think what is absolutely important in that context that we not take one solution to solve all challenges, but we actually go for several solutions. So talking about those several solutions means that we need to collaborate, for example, across industries, but also across sectors. And the example that Melinda just mentioned is all about that we work with the Finnish company Neste and the Austrian Borealis, and they provide raw materials that are based on renewable sources, in that case, leftover food, which then can be transformed into to, for example, durable plastics, for example, also plastics that go into wind turbine blades that Martin just mentioned. Coming back to what uh, Svenja Schulze said in this context, it is very important that we also need the right framework uh, that foster those collaboration and those frameworks can, for example, help to start markets up. Because currently, as Martin rightfully mentioned, and also Susanne Kartner in her contribution mentioned, we have the challenge that some of the technologies and some of the renewed raw materials are simply not cost competitive compared to fossil fuel based raw materials. And that is, I think, exactly the key where we can talk about quotas, but they can only be transitionary instruments because long term we need to make sure that politics are actually focusing on the right framework conditions and not on even further and more detailed regulation because regulations can be also prohibitive for new technologies and for the right technologies. And here we're talking about a bouquet of technologies that are needed to tackle those massive challenges to solve climate change, but also to come to a circular economy. Thank you very much for that. And I have a couple of audience questions that have come in, uh, Marcus. One of them I'm going to take as simply essentially reinforcing what you've just said about quotas. Uh, this user says, quotas are one thing, but why leave companies with no choice but only to use reusable materials? So comment on that if you like. But I, this is a second one that definitely is looking for an answer from you, and it's this. If sugar beet and corn are being considered as alternatives to fossil resources, how truly sustainable are these paths? Well, that's a very challenging topic in that context because this is not about food or fuel because what we have to tackle is actually that we use the natural resources more comprehensive on the one hand, but all also uh, with uh, much more responsibility. What does that mean? Yes, it can be an alternative to use, for example, corn starch or other real food sources also for chemical products, but only if we, on the other hand, still have fed the world. That means we have made sure that everybody uh, is, is having sufficient food and su uh, sufficient nutrition. And that's why also innovation and collaboration needs to make sure that the sources of those carbon that we need, for example, for durable plastics, for wind turbines, for example, and other very, very helpful um, applications come from different sources. Carbon dioxide could be a source, as mentioned earlier, but it could also be simply today's waste future raw materials. And that is exactly what we need to look at. So it's not one source, but also here the food or starch could be one source, at least for a transitionary period. Let me ask you uh, about uh, the use of CO2 itself as a raw material. Uh, it was mentioned in the film, and as I understand it, your company actually is already doing this in collaboration with the uh, Technical University in Aachen. It has found ways to turn securely bound CO2 into everyday products. Can you say a, a word about that and also about what's needed to support that kind of innovation? Yeah, Melinda, I think that is a very good example 
example about how innovation work because when we started with this project of using carbon dioxide actually what we tried to do was to solve an entirely different challenge here and during the research work we figured out well we could use that material as a full replacement for crude oil so no fossil fuels anymore and use then the resulting molecules to be used for example in soft foam mattresses and by that closing loops because if you take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere or out of other let's say industrial waste gas streams you could uh, uh, let's say save a significant amount of fossil fuels and by that contributing not only uh, let's say to climate uh, protection but also to a circular economy and in that context it is important that you cannot predict the outcome of innovation but be as, uh, as open as possible for as long as possible. So in a sense you're telling us that the chemical industry itself can almost become a carbon sink, uh, which is quite fascinating. Let me very quickly go back to Susanna Kadner to ask her about this, because of course Bill Gates made headlines uh, at the beginning of this year by saying that we must do much more to support technologies that can capture and convert CO2. How far do you think such technologies will take us? Are they the silver bullet? Um, no, certainly not. I think we need to be honest in a way and um, yeah, admit that carbon capture and utilization or using CO2 as a feedstock, they are not fully fledged mitigation um, strategies, but they can certainly contribute to innovation and play an important role there. But um, you already um, addressed the important point here when you talk about sinks and uh, carbon sinks. It's not only a very hotly debated topic when you talk about natural carbon sinks, um, but also in, in that context, because we just don't know yet how long this carbon will be stored in this specific material. Just like trees may be chopped down in a, in a, in a natural ecosystem, um, we don't know what we have to look at where the carbon goes. Is it in textile? Textiles. textiles have a sort of life cycle of five years. Does it go into building insulations like foams or something like that? Then you have a life cycle of 60 years. But we need to ask ourselves, so what happens after this first life cycle? Where is the pathway going? And if then the material is being burned, you can certainly not call this sort of like a carbon sink mechanism. We have to admit that. But if we have good strategies to really then keep the CO2 in a loop and bring it into adequate recycling, then maybe we are progressing um, towards such a sink mechanism. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on now to the next uh, of our crucial areas in driving uh, the circular economy. Let me just tell the audience, please keep those questions coming. We did have one more, but it relates to waste, and I'm going to take it when we start talking about recycling a little bit later. So let us move on now to a sector that's already been mentioned, namely energy. To foster the circular economy and transition to carbon neutrality by mid-century, Century, Germany's chemical industry alone would need about 600 terawatt hours of affordable green power. And ladies and gentlemen, just for orientation, that is more than Germany's total current electricity demand. Clean energy is on the rise. This year, renewables are expected to account for 30% of electricity generation worldwide, their biggest share in the power mix since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Experts see the opportunity to bring global energy-related CO2 emissions to net zero by 2050, a very tough but achievable goal. This is good news for another giant global project, the transition to a circular economy. Because circularity not only means more recycling and closing loops by using non-fossil raw materials, what we need is a holistic approach which also includes energy from renewable sources. This is particularly true for the chemical and plastics industry. The sector needs enormous amounts of green energy at reasonable cost in its long-term transition to the circular economy. A huge endeavor which is exacerbated by infrastructure problems, the lack of grids and storage systems. A promising storage solution is hydrogen. The success formula, make it with renewables and use it to produce sustainable plastics.
So as we heard there, enormous amounts of green power are going to be needed. And while progress is being made, we need to dramatically accelerate action, both on needed infrastructure and on scaling up promising innovations such as hydrogen. Let's drill a little bit deeper, and I want to come back to Minister Schulze now. And uh, dear Minister, Germany absolutely has been a leader in boosting solar and wind. And yet the Constitutional Court here recently decided that the government's climate protection law is not sufficient and essentially called on Berlin to do more. So in what areas might public-private partnership make a real difference in boosting renewables share going forward? I think the first thing is that we need more renewable energies and therefore we need the joint effort of everybody in our society because uh, every place we have we need to use for renewable energies, for solar power, for wind power. Um, that's, uh, that's not easy uh, because we are a very densely populated country. So uh, there is a, a fight about the, 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 the places where we could uh, bring out solar panels and uh, wind turbines. So it is not an easy discussion, but we need it because uh, we have now um, the, the decision to step out of coal. We decided before that we don't want to use nuclear power, so we need renewable energies. And we have now the right framework because we have this uh, Federal Climate Change Act. We re revised it uh, in a very short time. It's now on the parliament, so we have the right framework. But now we need a joint effort from every level in our country to build up renewable energies and to, to bring forward the infrastructure, the infrastructure for hydrogen, for example, and the infrastructure for all the renewable energies to bring them in the grid. Can you just say a, a bit more about hydrogen? Because, of course, it's being vastly hyped uh, and it's often said to be the key solution for heavy industry, including uh, chemicals. So maybe you can say a word about that and then we'll hear from Marcus how he sees it. I think hydrogen is very important. Hydrogen is very important for, for the heavy energy intensive industry like steel, like the chemicals industry. And there we need hydrogen first because there are very less alternatives. Hydrogen is the best alternative to reduce CO2. So uh, we do every effort in Germany to bring forward the production of hydrogen because we have two less production of hydrogen. We need more of that and we need the infrastructure uh, to uh, to bring it to the to the, the um, to the industry. Um, that is a big infrastructure challenge we have. And then we need international cooperation because we will not uh, produce uh, all the hydrogen we need in Germany. So uh, the, what we do is international cooperation, bringing forward the production of hydrogen in the MENA region, for example, in other countries, uh, just to have enough of that. And um, that's a challenge for the next years. Uh, in the moment, we have two less of hydrogen uh, production uh, in Germany. And uh, Markus Steilman, how do you see the role of hydrogen for your industry? And where would you say we're going to see absolutely crucial need for stakeholder cooperation? As far as I understand it, standards, for example, to ensure interoperability, uh, especially on different forms of hydrogen, absolutely key. What are you doing within your company to get ready for this new uh, source of hopefully green uh, energy? Yeah, I think what is really absolutely crucial, and uh, Svenja Schulze has already pointed that out, is uh, that in this context we make sure that the hydrogen is used where it is needed most. And so we have to think in different sectors. So in which sector is it most needed? For example, the steel industry needs it to get carbon neutral as quickly as possible. Secondly, it is for me the hydrogen is the link between uh, the energy industry and the chemical industry. So lots of chemical corporations heavily rely on using huge quantities of 
of hydrogen. And what we are doing to contribute is even though we are using very little hydrogen in our direct production, we have a technology in-house that we use to produce other chemicals, which is called electrolysis. And that fundamental knowledge we have, we are already today contributing to make sure that hydrogen can be produced via renewable electrical energy very effectively and efficiently. And that's a key challenge because otherwise you have big losses in the entire energy system when you go from electricity to hydrogen and then back into chemical or electrical processes. And that's where innovation is also key and collaboration is key. Let me bring in uh, Susanna uh, Kanner now, if I may. And uh, we heard the minister emphasizing both here in regard to energy in general and hydrogen in particular, but also uh, in her first remarks, uh, talking about the need for cooperation at the European level. So maybe you could say just a few words about where you see untapped potential for collaboration, particularly uh, on new sources of green energy. Well, I think, um, as Mr. Steilemann also said, you know, these are we are entering a completely new phase in looking at what are sort of the requirements of the difficult to decarbonize sectors. And uh, we have seen here that there are, uh, there are big projects that have been supported by our um, um, Ministry for Education and Research as well, um, looking into these power to X technologies. And this is exactly the point um, we are carrying out with Akatech at the moment um, and in cooperation with the with the BDE, a, a project where we look into the potential of uh, using hydrogen, producing hydrogen in uh, Australia, for example, and uh, setting up a cooperation with Germany to use this. And these are sort of like the new energy networks that we look at um, where we, we yeah we need to investigate into the potentials we need to become clear where they are we need to think about the relevant infrastructures and how they can set up be set up with uh, between these countries of such long distances of Australia there and looking at here in Europe so I think these are the areas for investigating how cooperation in that remark and in, in that area could work in the future. Thank you very much. And uh, speaking of cross-border collaboration, let me go to uh, Martin Norbert and then I'll come back to Marcus Steinman as well, because your companies have entered into a deal that at the time that it was signed was the world's largest industrial customer supply contract for electricity from offshore wind farms in the world. So first, Martin, what is needed to scale up this kind of collaboration? Yeah, exactly. So we entered into a large corporate power offtake uh, between Covestro and Ørsted uh, for Germany's first uh, subsidy-free offshore wind farm, uh, Borkum Rifcon 3, uh, the project is called. Uh, we uh, intend to take a final investment decision uh, later this year, uh, construct the wind farm uh, to be operational in 2025. I'm very happy that uh, Covestro basically uh, reached out to us uh, and we entered into a large offtake for 100 megawatt uh, out of the 900 megawatt uh, capacity that that uh, offshore wind project has. And offshore wind is a good sort of uh, uh, basically a, a blueprint for what we want to achieve because 10 years ago, offshore wind was considered a very, very expensive R&D experiment in the North Sea. Uh, you know, we needed subsidy four times uh, as much as wholesale electricity prices. But the industry has really through large scale innovation, scaling project, brought the cost down significantly, 70% cost reduction. Today we can uh, develop and build offshore wind farm without subsidy uh, and produce uh, large scale electricity that uh, companies like Covestro, but also other sectors, I mentioned uh, the steel sector, etc., are in strong need of. So what we need is to really accelerate that build out. Uh, and uh, the pain points that we are seeing in the offshore wind industry is uh, we need, uh, we basically need the space. The space is there. Uh, when you look at uh, the European Commission has a plan uh, to build uh, more than 300 gigawatt of offshore wind. Today we have 24 gigawatt uh, globally, more than 300 gigawatt by 2050. But we need to have uh, the space to develop the project. Uh, the space is there, but we need to get the permits uh, and the rights to develop these projects. Uh, we don't want to sort of wait for regulators, uh, you know, to do that in a lengthy process. Uh, we need to sort of streamline uh, permitting processes, and we need to build the grid infrastructure, both onshore and offshore. So, in terms of uh, accelerating the build out of renewable energy, uh, it's really sort of a joint effort needed here from industry and governments and regulators uh, to really sort of uh, fast track uh, towards 2030 and beyond. 
But then, uh, uh, when it comes, I mentioned it already, uh, we cannot just stop with the green electrons, uh, because for 20% uh, of the deep, ca deep carbonization uh, uh, targets we have, we need the green molecules. And again, here we are in new technology territory, and this is where we exactly need to do uh, what we did uh, 10 years ago with offshore wind, a new technology which was, uh, yes, heavily subsidized and supported, uh, but today it's a core part of the net reaching net zero in Germany, in Europe, and globally. So uh, we need to sort of lean in, uh, work pragmatically uh, in accelerating the build out uh, and make these projects work. Markus, any uh, quick thoughts to share with us in terms of that, this collaboration uh, with Ørsted and others like it on the energy uh, si si side? Yes, Melinda, absolutely. I, as to all that has been said, I couldn't agree more. And uh, from a, let's say, corporate perspective, it is absolutely important that we have risk mitigation. And that is exactly the right frameworks to get early, uh, let's say, technologies uh, to be scaled and uh, early technologies to be really get large. And that is absolutely key where politics can play a key role. We don't have an analytical problem. We currently have the challenge that we need to go into an era of execution and really deliver all the potential that those new technologies have by supporting them. Thank you very much. And I have a couple of audience questions that have come in. So let me uh, pose the first of these to uh, Minister Schulze. And the question is this, please share your thoughts regarding the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, ITER, the mega project that's working on nuclear fusion for electricity generation. <laughs> Uh, in Germany, we are very clear in that we think that nuclear power is not the, the energy form from the, of the future because it is so expensive. In my uh, budget, the half of my budget goes for uh, the, the nuclear uh, powers we used before. Uh, three generations used nuclear power plants. 30,000 are now dealing with the rest. Uh, of it with the litter of that. So uh, we decided phasing out nuclear power and uh, we're in the discussions with all the uh, European neighbors to, uh, to, to also trust in renewable energies. Uh, but not everybody is on that way. I have to respect that. Uh, but I think it is too expensive uh, solar power and wind power that we get for free. Why we should uh, invest in nuclear power plants? And uh, one more question, and this one goes to Martin Neubert, and it goes back to what we were discussing, uh, hydrogen and its potential. And the question is, how are prices for hydrogen developing, especially when hydrogen will be imported? Yeah, so uh, today renewable hydrogen compared to fossil fuel hydrogen, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's a significant cost gap. We talk about a sort of a factor of two to four. Uh, but it's not just sort of the technology, renewable hydrogen uh, will be produced through electrolysis uh, and today uh, we have uh, the technology available but only at a uh, small scale. Uh, we talk a few megawatt electrolyzers uh, that are currently uh, being developed and built. Uh, we ourselves have a two megawatt uh, first demonstration electrolyzer project here in Copenhagen. Um, and as with offshore wind, we started out small, the first offshore wind one was a uh, wind farm was a five megawatt wind farm off the coast uh, of South Denmark here. Uh, today we build uh, offshore wind farms at a scale of a nuclear power plant, so 1200, 1400 megawatt in size. So no doubt technology scaling will uh, provide a significant cost out. Uh, that's one part. But we also uh, need to remember that there is uh, significant work to be done on the regulatory side, uh, because uh, today electrolysis needs obviously large scale uh, renewable electricity. And renewable electricity in many markets, also in Germany, is subject to uh, you know grid fees and uh, tax levies. Uh, and here we need to create a level playing field between fossil uh, hydrogen and renewable hydrogen. Uh, that is a significant uh, part of it as well. And then uh, as we uh, will scale uh, uh, renewable hydrogen, the EU has a target to have installed 40 gigawatt of electrolyzers by uh, 2030. Uh, we're going to see sort of uh, a scale effect and a cost out effect uh, on that. Uh, so today uh, there's a significant cost gap, uh, which we need to reduce with scaling the technology, creating a regulatory level playing field, 
And then we need for the initial projects, because we cannot just wait until the technology is cost effective in itself. Uh, you know, this is part of uh, how do we create sustainability? We need to start moving, even though we don't have all the answers and all the visibility on the roadmap. We need to start moving now. And there we require government uh, support and funding, as we have seen it in, uh, in offshore wind, uh, which today is subsidy free. Thank you very much uh, for that. And we move on now to our third segment in the plastics value chain, the topic that has put this industry at the very center of the circular economy debate, namely waste management and recycling. Litter in the sea and on land, a frightening, but at the same time familiar picture. Nearly 80% of all plastic waste ended up in landfills or the environment between 1950 and 2015. The main cause for the waste issue lies in our hands. Global waste management is still very much underdeveloped. Here, rapid and decisive action is required. It's essential to build and expand modern infrastructure and to make society more aware of the issue. Above all, however, we need to see and use waste much more as a valuable resource. One-way use must be the past. The future is to drive materials in circles. Nothing shall be lost. Ideas and technologies to advance recycling are there. We must develop, scale and implement them. This is how we can stop plastic getting into the environment and ensure that it serves its actual purpose to ease and improve everyday life and pave the way to a sustainable future. Photographs of plastic waste piled up on Southeast Asian beaches brought it home to consumers in industrial countries. This is a global challenge. Yet, as we just heard, waste management and recycling systems remain rudimentary in many places across the world. The global economy is only 8.6 percent circular so far. So how do we bridge the global circularity gap? And again, I'd like to begin with you, dear Minister Schulze. Germany is a European leader, both in the quantity of plastic waste it produces, but also when it comes to sorting and recycling plastics, uh, not least thanks to the initiatives in your ministry to put into place a truly rigorous recycling law. So tell us, if you would, please, how far initiatives such as that one will take us. Are there obstacles to reaching even higher recycling targets? In Germany, we have very good experience with this uh, creating of a vital moment by establishing this uh, plastic recycling sector and uh, establishing this sector with this product responsibility for packaging waste and these recycling quotas. I think that is a combination that works way, very well. But if you look worldwide, we have, we have more basic problems. We need uh, uh, to create a, um, um, a curbside collection system for different waste streams in many, many countries. And this is the first step that you have such systems and collect the waste from the, uh, from the, um, um, from the curbside. And having that, that is the first step. And so that's our responsibility to help others to build up such systems. If you do it, like I see that in India, put it in the middle of the street and burn the waste, then you lose all the plastic, all the things you could recycle. So having a system of waste management, uh, that is the first step we need to establish internationally. And Susanna Kudner, maybe I can bring in here a question that has come in from the audience, uh, and it's this. How do we encourage and motivate people to participate in the circular economy, especially amongst developing nations where awareness levels still are low? As I said, it's a global challenge. What's your recommendation? Susanna Kadner, I fear that you are 
temporarily, hopefully, only temporarily frozen. So we will try to uh, come back to you. Hopefully you can uh, rejoin us in a moment. And uh, let me then uh, continue and um, ask uh, Marcus, uh, whether you at Covestro are working on initiatives, and this one is also uh, something that has come in from the audience, um, if I can find it, whether you have plans for small scale plants for waste treatment and not only uh, in your main industrial country markets. Yeah, I think uh, that also is uh, related to the question before for Susanne Kartner and uh, particularly relating also to what uh, Svenja Schulze actually said. It is so important that we create circular economies by motivating people on the one hand, but also making sure that we have the right, for example, waste collection systems, not only in developed countries, but also and particularly in developing countries. And here also have clear rules and regulations, for example, that no material should end up in landfill, but that we from the very beginning design our processes and our economy to close the loops and making sure that we look at waste as the future raw materials. And in that context, Covestro tries to contribute in areas, for example, where we have expertise and where we have knowledge, and that is particularly durable plastics. And here, for example, we recently established uh, a process that can turn soft foam mattresses after their usage back into the key raw materials and then use those key raw materials uh, immediately to produce new mattresses without any loss in quality. That has been shown in a small lab scale demonstration plant and now the key topic is can we qu uh, quickly scale it up and can we make it big? And I know from many industry colleagues and also from the partners with which we collaborate in the waste management industry, but also at our customers industry, that they're very eager to drive this forward. And that is now the next step. Next, for example, to the packaging uh, waste uh, directive that Svenja Schulze just mentioned and brought on its way, we need to continue further steps to really reach the goal of a fully circular economy. Let me see if we can go back to uh, Susanna Kadner. Susanna Kadner, can you hear us now? Okay, looks like we don't have her with us at the moment. So, Marcus, a, a second question to you, and it relates to the potential for chemical recycling, the process uh, that's known as depolymerization and that apparently Covestro is also experimenting with, breaking down plastic into its component parts obviously offers a fantastic opportunity to turn unusable waste into usable primary uh, materials. So what's the time frame for this to get it to market, to really uh, scale it up? And how do you see it, its potential also in the countries of the global south? Do they have the funding and the skills to also use a very sophisticated technology like this one? Yeah, that's a very challenging question, honestly speaking, but also one of the key questions that we have to actually to answer. So looking at chemical recycling, I know there is a lot of debate currently about what is chemical recycling, is it not actually uh, a, a bad solution? I believe it is exactly a magic wand. It is exactly the Swiss army knife that we need because many of the recycling technologies that are used today, for example mechanical recycling, is not able to uh, recycle lots of the really needed materials that we have currently in use and that for example are desperately needed for renewable energy but also for secure food supply and for energy efficient buildings. So long story short we need an additional technology, we need a portfolio of technologies that help us to solve these issues. And when it comes to participation and also wealth generation in different areas of the world, I think it could be one of the solutions that we bring further those technologies also into countries of the so-called global south, because with that we bring wealth and we bring highly qualified job, jobs also into this area, and we also help to build local economies. Thank you so much. And let me go back now to Susanna Kadner. It looks like uh, we have you back unfrozen with us. Uh, very <laughs> glad about that. So we've been talking about how we bring the Global South into these joint solutions and collaborative efforts that we're talking about. And an audience question came in that I'd like to get your take on, and it's this. How do we encourage and motivate people to participate in the circular economy initiatives, especially in developing nations where awareness levels may be low? 
Yeah, thank you for this question. Yeah, my apologies for having been disconnected. This is the technological challenges we are still facing. Well, I think if we look at the role in the global south, there's um, well different perspectives and what different countries play when we talk about yeah being involved in the sort of circularity is it or in the transition to a circular economy. So some countries are currently resources exporting countries. So we really need a strong dialogue here of how. Which role will they take in the future if, for example, Europe um, will reduce its demand on uh, special metals or something like that, for example, because we actually were successful in closing loops? So which role do resource exporting countries have in the future? And uh, can they be built up um, with a high, uh, yeah, high quality recycling infrastructure and which support in terms of tech transfer, knowledge transfer, but also leveraging finance, uh, financial investments, which role can we play there and then there's the other hand of course which role do um, yeah waste importing countries have we've seen the ban from china on solids waste and it sort of underlines the role that we really need to think about the transparency in supply chains of waste and secondary raw materials and we need to make sure that the same standards apply from like what we know as responsible sourcing to responsible recycling. We need to make sure that um, here the potential in the global south are tapped. Um, they're already engaging in many circularity activities like repair, for example, but some of the recycling activities we see there are really harmful to the, to the health of, of the workers there. So we need to make sure that these operations are carried out in an ethical and socially compatible and of course environmentally useful and beneficial way. Indeed, our first film, in fact, included pictures of people in enormous waste dumps uh, with bags that they were putting uh, recyclable products into. So let me uh, now go to a questioner who's with us live on video, as I understand. And uh, please share your question briefly, if you would, please. Hello, can you hear us? Please go ahead. Brief question, Hello, if you would. Hello, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, yes, we can. Okay, okay, thank you. So um, I had a question earlier regarding um, the innovation for this um, project. So the world today is currently moving into um, the global circular um, economy, which is something that is really fascinating and which we should all be working towards. But um, funding these projects are not really, it's, it's actually challenging compared to countries where these um, infrastructures are already available, like in Africa currently today, in Nigeria, because um, I'm from Nigeria, and um, this is something I'm also, I'm also working towards. It's a project I'm also working towards. And there are one of, some of the challenges we do face in establishing these projects as a f for a private sector is the, the funding for these projects. Mm -hmm. And um, aside the creating of awareness, there there is really a low a low percent of people are aware of the dangers involved to uh, our, our ecosystem is currently facing. And um, yeah, um, I also appreciate the fact someone asked, how do we create this awareness to these people? So um, Nigeria even producing a, one of the one of the very large amount of waste, and um, just a little bit of little bit of it is being even renewed or re reused this is also a troubling matter so i would like to know if this is just focused on the european sector or it's also focused here um, also in africa because thank there are you, also so, so many much. of us out here who want yeah. to develop this Thank you so much. And of course, we have just been talking about raising awareness. But let me go back to the minister, Minister Schulze, on this point, because you work very, very yeah. closely with your colleagues uh, in the Germany's Ministry for Development Cooperation, uh, Svenja Schulze. So maybe you can say a little bit about joint initiatives that you are pursuing with uh, what we here, we here in Germany call the BMZ in order to truly support the sustainable development goals in Africa. Mm. Yes, that is a strong public, uh, problem that we need to get funding for such uh, projects. And um, two years ago, uh, the German parliament said, 
Okay, we want to help. They see all the pictures from from the waste in the oceans, and they they bring forward a new okay. program where we could help to right, establish waste management systems worldwide. And this program, we have that in in my ministry. That is very successful. We have a lot of countries who who want to cooperate with us because it is not only the money. We also. Uh, get in contact and have an exchange about knowledge, um, because it's not not only money; it is also knowledge and how to establish such such systems. So it is just a small program, but we try to help uh, from from Germany to to establish such, such systems around the world because we are and we have the responsibility. We have all the knowledge. We have all the techniques. So uh, we try. Uh, to bring international corporations forward, but I know there is always uh, not not enough money for all the these things we need to do. And of course, uh, that money will be a big topic as we move toward Glasgow and the COP26 this fall. Let me bring in Martin Norbert for one very short last word. I'm sorry, Martin, our time is almost up. But I'd like to ask you to talk just very briefly, if you would, also about changing attitudes. Because I know that Ørsted does carry out studies about changing public attitudes when it comes to sustainability. What can you tell us about how public awareness is changing, briefly, if you would? Yeah, and maybe also linking this, uh, Melinda, to back to the point of recycling. Uh, I mentioned uh, that we in the wind industry, we use uh, uh, composite material uh, for the plates uh, or for the nacelles. Uh, and uh, we will see now over the coming years an increasing amount of, in the first place, onshore wind farms uh, that we built uh, 25 years ago being decommissioned. Uh, and what do we do with these plates? Uh, uh, there's an estimate that by 2025, uh, we talk about 25,000 tons annual composite material that comes uh, from uh, in the first place onshore wind farms but then if you go sort of five ten years further out uh, we will also see the first offshore wind farms being decommissioned and uh, what do we do there instead of uh, as it has been in the past of you know landfilling uh, these composite materials uh, and this is where we work uh, as earth that just as an example why we don't have the problem ourselves you can say uh, because our offshore wind projects uh, they are not for decommissioning before sometimes in the 30s. Uh, but that's exactly not the attitude uh, we are taking. We are saying we are, want to be part of the solution. We don't want to be a part of the problem. The wind industry, we don't want to become sort of the new nuclear in terms of creating a waste problem. So that's why we nurse that uh, we have decided to immediately uh, 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 ban uh, all landfill. Uh, and the industry is working exactly sort of in the same direction. Uh, we are working on a, a project called Decomplates, uh, where we work together with two universities with uh, turbine suppliers, uh, but also with uh, you know established uh, industry players, for instance, in the cement industry, to uh, figure out a way of uh, decomposing uh, these composite materials through uh, pyrolysis uh, and use uh, those scattered materials, for instance, in the cement industry. Uh, so, and, and talking about that, uh, making uh, it clear to the public uh, that why we don't have all the answers uh, and not all the solutions, we anyway sort of keep going uh, and uh, we set ourselves ambitious target. We nurse that we will be uh, net zero in terms of our own scope one and two emissions by 2025, but we cannot stop there. Also scope three, which relates to our entire supply chain. We want to take an ambitious step uh, with decarbonizing that by 50% by 2032 and being also scope three fully net zero by 2040. So it's, it's very important uh, to bring these tangible examples uh, into the public uh, and make people aware what can be done? Uh, and here in Earth, that we think uh, we have a, a role to play of telling our story of transforming over the last 10 years, but also how we want to help now to really create a world that runs entirely on green energy. And I know that those studies that I mentioned that Ørsted has conducted have shown that consumer attitudes absolutely are changing and that there's far greater awareness of the need to accelerate action, including by working together. And hopefully our discussion as well has contributed to that aim and to that public awareness. Certainly, I would like to thank all of you for this very, very interesting exchange of perspectives and views on joint solutions and collaboration as the driver for a circular economy in plastics and 
I'm very grateful to all of you for taking part. Minister Schulz, Susanne Kladner, uh, Martin Neubert, and here with me in the studio, Markus Steilemann. Thanks also to Cavestro, of course, for making this debate possible. And to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, we very much appreciate your taking part, your attention throughout uh, our discussion, and your questions and comments. Hopefully our paths will cross again in future. Until they do, stay healthy. Goodbye.